Hello, this is Michael Altos. We're starting a section on neuromuscular blocking agents and reversal drugs. This is recording part one. Let's start by reviewing the neuromuscular junction, which is the narrow gap between the neuron and the muscle fiber. When the nerve depolarizes, calcium ions enter the neuron and acetylcholine is released from the vesicles in the nerve terminal. The acetylcholine goes into the neuromuscular junction and binds to nicotinic cholinergic receptors that are on the motor end plate of the muscle fiber. The acetylcholine receptor then opens its ion channel and it generates an end plate potential which propagates along the muscle membrane and leads ultimately to contraction. <clears throat> the amount of acetylcholine that's released is much more, at least tenfold more, than the amount needed for depolarization. This gives us a buffer so that we have adequate strength, even if there is a depletion of acetylcholine. The acetylcholine is then hydrolyzed by acetylcholinesterase, which is embedded in the motor end plate membrane. Then the acetylcholine receptors close, the end plate repolarizes, and the muscle begins to relax. Next, we're going to discuss the principles of depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. These drugs resemble acetylcholine and bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors as an agonist. Because they are an agonist, they generate a muscle action potential, which leads to the fasciculations that we see, the twitching of the muscle fibers. These drugs are not metabolized by acetylcholine esterase, as we will discuss later on. We'll look at uh, twitch monitors in a short time, but right now we need to emphasize that depolarizing drugs cause phase one or phase two block. Phase one is the common block that we see with depolarizing agents. After fasciculations, the end plate cannot repolarize and the muscle becomes flaccid. This is the normal depolarizing block that we see with drugs like succinylcholine. Patients who have paralysis from phase one block will not have any fade effect seen on the twitch monitor. The twitch monitor will just show constant but diminished intensity of the twitches. <clears throat> These drugs are not normally reversed. There is no specific reversal agent that exists. Instead, recovery occurs when the agent diffuses away from the neuromuscular junction and then undergoes hydrolysis by plasma pseudocholinesterase. In fact, an attempt to reverse phase one block with an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor like neostigmine could paradoxically lead to prolonged depolarization and prolonged clinical weakness. There is an effect called phase two block, which occurs only with depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. This occurs when there is prolonged depolarization due to high doses or long durations of exposure to these drugs, and it causes an abnormal response to acetylcholine. This is not common, and you may never see it in your practice. When it occurs, it looks like a non-depolarizing block, meaning you'll see fade with peripheral nerve stimulation. And the mechanism isn't fully understood. Some explanations include there's some sort of presynaptic block which reduces the synthesis and mobilization of acetylcholine, or perhaps some post-junctional receptor desensitization. Also, this phenomenon is accelerated in the presence of inhalational anesthetic drugs. When patients do have phase two block, in theory, it could be reversed with anticholinesterase drugs, but in practice, it's not recommended because the response is difficult to predict. The standard recommendation is that patients who have phase two block should be allowed to recover spontaneously, which may take many minutes or even hours, depending on the circumstance. Those patients should be supported with uh, ventilation and provided uh, reassurance and sedation until they regain their clinical strength. Let's start by talking about succinylcholine. As you can see, it's basically two acetylcholine molecules joined together. So it binds 
at the acetylcholine receptor as an agonist, and it's the only available depolarizing muscle relaxant. It has a rapid onset of 30 to 60 seconds and a short duration of action, usually less than 10 minutes. It's rapidly metabolized by pseudocholinesterase, which is in the plasma. So there's a gigantic first pass effect when we inject this into the venous system, and only a small fraction of drug ever reaches the neuromuscular junction. You may see prolonged action in patients who are hypothermic, pregnant, have liver disease, or renal failure. Patients who have an abnormal pseudocholinesterase gene will have prolonged activity of succinylcholine. About 1 in 50 people is heterozygous, so they have one copy of the normal gene and one abnormal copy, and these patients may have a 20 to 30 minute block instead of a less than 10 minute block. 1 in 3,000 patients are homozygous for an abnormal pseudocholinesterase gene, and they will have 4 to 8 hours of blockade after a single dose of succinylcholine. There is really no treatment for these patients. The best recommendation is to just support them with mechanical ventilation until they recover. Dibucane is a local anesthetic that inhibits pseudocholinesterase. So often these patients will have a dibucane number, which is what percent inhibition does the pseudocholinesterase get? Patients who have normal pseudocholinesterase will have 80 to 100 percent inhibition by dibucane. Patients who are heterozygous will have 40 to 60 percent inhibition. And patients who have two abnormal copies will have 0 to 20 percent inhibition by dibucane. We said before that you should not try to reverse succinylcholine blockade with a cholinesterase inhibitor. It can actually prolong your phase one depolarizing block. When you inhibit acetylcholinesterase and you get this high concentration of acetylcholine, it actually intensifies the depolarization. If we inhibit pseudocholinesterase, we also reduce hydrolysis of succinylcholine. And this occurs when we inhibit acetylcholinesterase. What about patients who are receiving non-depolarizing agents? What happens when they get that together with succinylcholine? Well, small doses of non-depolarizers can actually antagonize the ability of depolarizers to have a clinical effect. However, pancuronium has a unique characteristic in that it inhibits pseudocholinesterase, which could lead to a prolonged effect of succinylcholine. Sucks is used at a dose of 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. Some have used a dose as low as 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. At lower doses, there's increased likelihood that the patient will start breathing again before they desaturate. And that's supposedly the safety factor of succinylcholine, that if you can't manage the airway, they could potentially recover spontaneous breathing before they suffer a hypoxic injury. Most recommend using true body weight, not ideal body weight, for dosing of succinylcholine. You can redose succinylcholine with boluses of 10 to 20 milligrams, and an infusion of succinylcholine can be used at a rate of anywhere from 0.5 to 10 milligrams per minute. This is often done by mixing one or two vials in a 100 milliliter bag and titrating to effect using a nerve stimulator. Succinylcholine can be given intramuscularly in case of emergency, four to five milligrams per kilogram, and it can be used to treat laryngospasm. Again, give it IV, and you don't need much, just 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. Or if you have no IV, you could give it intramuscularly in an emergency, and some have suggested injecting it straight into the tongue to get the most rapid absorption of the drug. Most of the side effects from succinylcholine are due to its resemblance to acetylcholine. In the heart, it binds to the muscarinic cardiac acetylcholine receptors and leads to bradycardia and decreased contractility. At higher doses, you could see an opposite effect, maybe because it's binding to the nicotinic receptors in the autonomic ganglia. But mostly we see bradycardia, especially in children or if you do repeat dosing in adults. You may want to have atropine or glycopyrrolate available if you see bradycardia with succinylcholine. Fasciculations are very common with succinylcholine, and they can be prevented with a small dose of non-depolarizing drug given five minutes in advance. 
and it has to be a small dose so the patient is able to maintain their ventilation and not feel short of breath or paralyzed. Patients may feel myalgias after receiving succinylcholine, and this may be present, prevented by giving that defasciculating dose of non-depolarizer. Patients who receive succinylcholine will have increased intracranial pressure and increased gastric pressure. This is not consistently observed, and the defasciculating dose can attenuate this effect. However, increased intraocular pressure, whose mechanism is not really understood and is not just due to the intramus extraocular muscles, this effect is not attenuated with a defasciculating dose. There's a concern that a patient with a ruptured globe, an eye injury, could extrude their ocular contents when they receive succinylcholine. There really aren't good reports of this. And if you have a patient with a full stomach and an eye injury, many people recommend going ahead with the succinylcholine. Hyperkalemia is a major concern with succinylcholine. This occurs because of the sustained opening of those ion channels and the membrane depolarization. People normally will have a serum potassium increase of about 0.5 milliequivalents per liter. And this is true for anybody. Even patients in renal failure, who we know we should be careful with potassium in these patients, there's no evidence that they are any more susceptible to an exaggerated hyperkalemic response compared to, uh, in uh, response to succinylcholine compared to anyone else. There are some patients who are at risk for an increased hyperkalemic response. Patients with severe metabolic acidosis and hypovolemia could have a high resting potassium level and an exaggerated hyperkalemic response. And some say that you should treat these patients with hyperventilation and sodium bicarbonate before you give succinylcholine. There is a report that suggests that patients who have severe intra-abdominal infections, especially if it's been going on for more than a week, may have an exaggerated hyperkalemic response as well. Now, patients who have a neural injury will have a proliferation of acetylcholine receptors over the entire cell membrane. So when they receive succinylcholine, they get a widespread depolarization and it happens regardless of how much or how little succinylcholine you use, and there's a massive release of potassium. It can increase by four to 10 milliequivalents per liter, and this of course can be fatal. And giving them that defasciculation dose, that non-depolarizer first, does not prevent the hyperkalemia. This risk starts within about 96 hours after a neural injury, and it peaks seven to 10 days out and can last for up to six months or even longer. Who is at risk for this catastrophic side effect? Patients who have had third degree burns, massive skeletal traumas, upper motor or neuron injuries like strokes or spinal cord injuries, denervation leading to muscular atrophy, and other myopathies like myotonia or muscular dystrophy. The next side effect we want to discuss is phase two block. We referred to this earlier. This occurs when patients receive high doses or long durations of exposure to succinylcholine. Let's say you run an infusion for 30 to 60 minutes or more. Patients who have pseudocholinesterase deficiencies could get phase two block after a single dose. That's probably why they have this four to eight hour prolonged response. Other explanations are that they have some sort of presynaptic block which reduces synthesis and mobilization of acetylcholine, or maybe some desensitization at the postjunctional receptor. How much sucks does a patient need to receive in order to get phase two block? There's a lot of different data out there. Some say two milligrams per kilogram, some say 10 milligrams per kilogram. Inhalation drugs like, like halothane or sevoflurane accelerate the onset of phase two block, and that may be why there's this wide range of values. Now, technically, you can try to use anticholinesterase drugs to antagonize phase two block, but the response is very difficult to predict, and most recommend allowing the patient to recover spontaneously instead. We know that succinylcholine is a trigger of malignant hyperthermia, as we discussed in a previous lecture. And we said before, there are other things that succinylcholine does that are not malignant hyperthermia. 
patients with muscular dystrophy who have a hyperkalemic arrest, patients who have neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which looks like MH, but they can receive succinylcholine without any problems, masseter muscle rigidity, which can occur in response to succinylcholine. And as we discussed before, we often take precautions for malignant hyperthermia if we see masseter muscle rigidity after patients receive succinylcholine. To summarize all of this, what are the absolute contraindications to succinylcholine? Well, malignant hyperthermia for sure. Patients who have dangerously elevated potassium levels, so greater than let's say five and a half or six, places where we really can't afford to have it go any higher. Patients who have a known myotonia or muscular dystrophy. And patients who have any of these CNS injuries or massive injuries. And for that, you have probably two to four days before the problem begins. So immediately it's safe. But after about the 48 hour mark, we should avoid succinylcholine. We'll stop here, and in the next recording, we'll discuss some of the non depolarizing agents.